Hi everyone, welcome to Mains Maxima program. So the aim of this Mains Maxima program is to help the UPSC aspirants who are appearing for the Mains examinations to maximize their marks with reference to your Mains answer writing. So in this video, we'll be discussing a set of questions exclusively on the topic economy. So to begin with, the first question is, post 2010, Indian economy has faced various challenges in the form of banking fraud and scams which has the potential to hamper the economic growth. So in this context, discuss the structural reforms that needs to be undertaken in order to make the Indian banking system more sustainable. So now we know that a lot of banking, banking fraud and scams has taken place in our banking sector which has literally reduced the efficiency uh, and the functioning of our banking system, right? So now in this particular question, we are going to discuss about the certain structural reforms that need to be taken so as to make our Indian banking system more sustainable. So you can start your answer with an introduction guys as to we know that the banking okay that is intrinsically human centric in spite of you know all the evasion the increasing evasions of machine and we know one of the most common problem which we face is the employees they are not adapted to the new technologies that has been used as a result of which what happens you know they are lacking you know knowledge in those technological aspects where a lot of fraudries and scams is also taking place so you can start the introduction like that so in order to make the banking system bounce back, it will require us to focus more, you know, in, uh, in certain structural reforms. So why guys, why do we need certain structural reforms? Because of the problems that we're facing with reference to your banking sectors, right? There is a the lack of, you know, technological aspects, then the lack of knowledge with respect to the employees and also a lot of negligence by them and the increase in fraud, re fraud reason scams. So because of all these issues, we need to have a proper or a, you know, effective structural reforms in our banking system so that will be more efficient. So in this particular question, we are going to discuss about what structural reforms should be taken in order to make sure that our intent banking system is more sustainable and structurized okay so to begin with the first point you can talk about is so the first point is with reference to recruitment see the public sector undertaking banks they are a diverse lot see besides their geographical cultural and linguistic disparity quantitatively their business are wide apart and today if you see guys the recruitment which has been done in the public sector undertaking banks they are you know it's generalized it is not that specific what we need is you know appointment or recruitment of people who are specialized or experts in that particular department or branch for the functioning or efficiency of the banking system in a better way so that should literally be taken as one of the structural reforms so as to make your intent banking system more efficient or sustainable so you can include that point guys and now if you see some data, banks being special and need specialized talent, it has been observed globally. Okay. In contrast to this, if you see the specialist or the experts with reference to your public sector undertaking banks that constituted only a mere of say like 5 to 8% of the total workforce. And this was estimated by, you know, the KPMG that is the National Skill Development Corporation report. As per that data only, we could see that just, you know, a mere of 5 to 8% of total workforce only is being specialized uh, or the appointment is specialized with reference to the public sector undertaking banks. And that percentage itself is literally very low, right? You can even mention that. So because of this, only we need to be more focusing on appointing experts who are specialized in that particular, uh, you know, branch or field. Okay, so this is one particular reform that you can focus on. So moving on to the next point, we have remuneration. That is the number, the wages or the salaries that we get. So now, as per the RBI data, that is the Reserve Bank of India data, the compound annual growth rate of per employee wages and salaries that was 13.7 percent from 2004 5 2010 11 that is literally decreased guys that is decelerated to 6.4 6.4 percent from 2010 11 to 2016 17 from this itself we can understand that the wages or salaries of the employees literally being decreased which again is you know uh, constitute or it leads to an inefficiency in the bank system when your salaries and wages are not up to the mark Definitely what happens, the output or the productivity or the efficiency of the employees decreases, right? That is a normal thing for the workers. So that is yet again another important problem. For that, what we should do? Therefore, instead of collective bargaining, the salaries of this public sector undertaking bank employees, guys, they need to be linked to the respective bank's ability to pay, okay, with certain components of variable pay. Thus, the senior manage management, they should also have employee stock ownership plans. All these things will enable, you know, uh, the process of remuneration to be better. That is yet another important solution that you can give for making your intent banking system more structuredized. Okay. So the next point is with reference to reskilling. 
See, reskilling is very important, guys, because already the skilled people would have been employed, but we are not upgrading or improving their skill. As a result of which, again, what happens? It leads to certain flaws in the efficiency or functioning of your banking system. So now, if you see the 2014 RBI Committee on Capacity Building in banks and non-bank institutions, they made a lot of recommendations for what? For the development of talent pool or pipeline in banks on a buy and build basis. Why? So that will enable them guys to keep a pace with the rapid technological advancements. Because these bank employees who have been employed, they should they literally know how to make use of these new new technologies that has been coming in lieu with the banking process and operations. That is very important for them to function very efficiently. Because as I told you initially when we started the introduction, though banking is uh, intricately you know, human centric, you have a lot of uh, you know increase in the evasion of machines. So they should be adaptable to working with those technological advancements. So that the efficiency of banking uh, will increase. Okay. Thus, the report needs to be implemented without delay. And thus, it also suggests what guys, the importance of both the internal as well as specialized certification based external training programs, which is coupled with appropriate placement policies in banks, so as to bridge this talent deficit. We know that we are lacking in that particular aspect. So now, again, a skill development, you can say, that is reskilling the people who are already employed to those uh, and then they were upgrading them to technological advancements. Okay, that is yet again another important uh, you know, solution that you can take or uh, another structural reform that you can take to make your Indian banking system more sustainable. We know that research and development, it is very, very important for the growth and functioning of any organization, right? So with respect to banking, that must be recognized as a knowledge-based industry like your IT, that is information technology, where decisions necessitate, necessitate constant research and development, that is your R&D. Because when you have a research and development wing, automatically they'll be focusing on all the areas which needs to be improved. Thereby, you can provide constant or immediate solutions to all those problems so that you'll be able to you know, overcome the flaws in a very immediate manner. If you see, only a few large banks, they have research units, guys and which are by and large you know they are devoted to macroeconomic studies so we have a huge number of banks and out of that only very few large banks are having a department called as R&D wing that is your research and development wing and a research unit that must literally contribute what guys or priority should be given to the you know contributing to the prosperity of its own bank either directly or indirectly and then which will automatically lead to our efficiency in a systematic way thus this public sector undertaking bank leadership must embrace the knowledge and learning ecosystem to put in simple terms when you're talking about research you have to understand that guys without efficient research and development wing you cannot overcome the problem that is arising with reference to your banking efficiency and functioning so if another structural reform could be you know having a proper r d wing in every large bank especially with respect to your public sector undertaking banks so as to enable them to function properly thus we have discussed a set of points in which uh, you know uh, what sort of structural reforms could be done in order to make your bank system more sustainable especially the intent banking system so now we can conclude your answer by telling that Human resource capabilities that have a strong correlation, guys, with the business results. And if you take the case of public sector undertaking banks, the time has literally come to move on from the episodic HR initiatives to connecting HR to the mainstream corporate strategy and thereby transformation agendas. To put it in simple terms, what they're trying to say is that along with you know uh, this human capabilities, what we have, we need to be in lieu with the technological improvements that is taking place so that when we keep ourselves updated when especially when the banking employees who are working there when they are keeping themselves very updated or when they are for, you know meant for doing that particular job in the most efficient or advanced way automatically reform has been taking place right and again as whatever our points we discussed if all these things are taken or implemented properly definitely we can have a strong structural reforms thereby ensuring that there is a sustainability in the functioning of Indian banking system. So I hope you've clearly understood uh, this particular answer, which is talking about the structural reforms of Indian banking industry. And now apart from this, guys, you can even uh, in the introduction, uh, you can even include a point whereby recently the City Union Bank, okay, they faced a cyber, uh, cyber security attack where, uh, where the SIF SWIFT system. That is an example where you can give showing the inefficiency in the bank system. So now if you are having strong people or specialized or expert people in order to do the ethical hacking, definitely such kind of issues will not arise. Thus, if even if you see the uh, Semantex report, you know, India ranks four with respect to cyber security breach. 
so this itself shows that there is a uh, there is a you know immediate or urgent need to recruit people who are so specialized and skilled with respect to these public sector undertaking banks so that the efficiency will increase we will be more specialized and all these hacking will not take place so this is how we can conclude your answer the next question is discuss the prospects and challenges of leather and textile industry for the indian economy and the previous year question paper also we had a question in connection with this so this particular question is having a lot of importance so now in this particular question we are going to have a detailed discussion as to what are the prospects and also the issues or challenges with respect to the you know leather and textile industry taking into consideration the indian economy so you can start your answer by talking about the need for india to generate more jobs right so now india needs to generate jobs which are very formal and also productive thereby it provides a bang for buck in terms of jobs which are created relative to your investment thereby having what guys the potential for a broader social transformation and we can also generally you know increase your exports and thereby growth only when the export of a country increases we know that it can lead to a huge higher economic growth because what are we doing in our country there is more of import and less of export that is why there is always a deficit in our bop that is a balance of payment and as a result of which the development is not too fast we know that right and again employment issues we do know that we have facing a lot of employment unemployment problems in our country right and now focusing on the uh, question that is with respect to leather and footwear industries if you see the apparel and the leather and footwear sectors they may meet many or all of these criteria we are going to talk about the prospects with reference to the uh, you know apparel and leather industry okay that is the textiles and leather industry the first point being the apparel and leather sectors they offer tremendous opportunities guys for creation of job especially women we know that especially in rural areas also when such kind of industries start you know working in such kind of industries the mostly you know there is no need for any skill laborers mostly unskilled and semi skilled laborers are involved in such kind of apparel and leather sectors so in that case especially for women belong to rural area also they get a lot of employment opportunities then second point is you can talk about india has an opportunity to promote apparel leather and footwear sectors why because of the rising wage levels in china that has resulted in china stabilizing or losing market share in their products you can even mention about that also and moving on the next one if you see india is well positioned so as to take advantage of china's decreasing or deteriorating competitiveness guys why because age cost in most indian state are significantly lower than that in china in that case again india has an advantage okay so this point also you can mention under your prospects and now moving on the next one the space which has been vacated by china is fast being taken over by whom by bangladesh and vietnam in case of apparels so now when china's position has been or when they are uh, having a decrease in this particular sector what happens then other countries are get, getting it occupied so now in case of vietnam and indonesia guys especially with respect to leather and footwear india needs to act fast if it is to regain competitiveness and thereby a market share in these sectors what they trying to say from this is see when one particular country or when one particular country is literally uh, you know uh, uh, performing less with reference to these particular sectors we should make sure that we are trying to occupy that particular market that is what this particular you know point talks about so now with respect to you know uh, india it needs to act very fast if it has to regain the competitiveness competitiveness and also the market share in all these sectors that is your apparel and also your leather and footwear because there is opportunity for us to explore but we are not able to explore to the fullest that is what this particular point talks about and thus india has a potential comparative advantage in terms of cheaper and more abundant labor and we know that that is one of the most important reason why a large number of multinational corporations that is the mnc's come to india right because indian labor is very cheap and also at the same time we have a large consumer and emerging consumer market so that also you can mention here guys and now moving on to challenges you can talk about you know the logistics that is the cost and time which is involved in getting goods from factory to the destination guys that is from the place of production to the place of consumption that is the ultimate from the producer to the ultimate consumer that is greater than those for other countries that is one particular point that you can mention here then the next point is further very few large capacity containers uh, that is the vlcc they come to indian ports to take these cargo so what happened to exports now now the exports have to be transshipped through colombo which literally increases your travel cost so thus it reduces what guys the flexibility for manufacturers when that is the case what happens guys it becomes too costly to you know too costly that is again you know an a disadvantage we are uh, they are not interested in uh, you know carrying on the business with respect to their apparel or your leather or your footwear you understand that is what again this particular point talks about 
and the next point is the next important challenge is with reference to labor regulations guys see the problems are well known that is the regulations on minimum overtime pay and also the mandatory contributions that literally become the de facto taxes for low paid workers especially in small firms which results in 45% of low disposable salary. So what this point is telling you is that, see these low paid workers, they also are literally, you know, liable to pay a tax, but that too in a hidden way. That is what this particular, uh, you know, uh, point talks about in, because of all these labor regulations that they have. That is yet take another important challenge, guys, that this particular, uh, you know, apparels or leather uh, footwear industry is facing. Okay. And now, since there are strict regulations for overtime wage payment as your minimum wages act, that is 1948, what, that mandates payment for of overtime wages at twice the rate of ordinary rates of wages of workers. But do you think they are paid like that? See, first of all, though we have the Minimum Wages Act of 1948, in certain companies or certain industries, the way our workers are not paid based on this particular act or based on the rules and regulations. So now when they are overtimely, when they are working, as per this Minimum Wages Act, you are supposed to get twice or thrice of what your ordinary payment is. But that is not happening. That is yet again another important challenge. Okay. And thus, the Indian apparel and leather firms, they are very smaller compared to the firms, uh, say, in China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Though we have the potential to explore, what is happening? We are not able to expand our industries uh, in a way as compared to so, some other giants like the China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Definitely, we should be able to expand, guys, because we do have a very cheap labor. We do have the problem of unemployment. By starting more of apparels and leather industries, you can provide work to all these unskilled and semi-skilled workers. Okay. The next important challenge is with reference to your tax and tariff policies. See, on the one hand, when there is a high tariff, okay, on yarn and fiber, what happened? It'll increase the cost of producing clothing. Fine. Now, India imposes a 10% tariff on man-made fibers compared to the 6% on cotton fibers. So, this is yet again, you know, uh, another important point that you can mention. And along with that, to some extent, okay, this need not affect the export competitive competitiveness, guys. Why? Because of the drawback for tariffs paid on inputs is available. Now, but when these drawbacks, when they're not provided for purchase of domestically produced yarn, then what will happen? Automatically, it will reflect the high tariffs, thereby adding to the clothing cost. To put in simple terms, it will increase the price of clothing. So again, what is happening to our economy? We are at a, we are facing uh, the problem of price rise, right? That is what this particular point is trying to tell. And now, the next point is, see, again, on the other hand, the domestic taxes, that is also favoring the cotton-based production rather than production based on man-made fibers with a 7% tax on the former, that is your uh, cotton-based production and 8.4% for, for 8 on the latter, that is the man-made fibers. So now, now this is also, you know, from this we can see that the, this particular domestic taxes, they are in favor of the cotton-based production. But in our uh, economy, we know that most of the uh, things, you know, are uh, mostly this man-made fibers and people since they are uh, semi-skilled and unskilled, we prefer this but still what is happening to that the tax rate is more on this and the next point is thus the global demand for footwear is shifting away from leather footwear towards non-leather footwear see we know that guys this le leathers it's a very costly uh, you know product or it is a thing which is adding to the status or symbol of people but though this particular leather comes under your uh, you know weblin effect which uh, talks about the conspicuous consumption because it's a product which gives you a status of uh, prestige Literally, in practicality, if you see, as far as India is concerned, due to so many social and cultural constraints, we are not, you know, that interested of most of the people are not in the, you know, nature of buying or demanding more of leather products. So that is again because of, as I told, a lot of social and cultural constraints. So now what happens, as I said, it is again affecting our industry to a greater extent because when the demand is less, what happens? Though you produce also, you should, the people should be willing to buy it, right? That is also there. Uh, so that again, you know, uh, this is a yet again another challenge that you can mention here. And again, if you see guys, traditionally India, okay, there has been export of leather footwear. Now, its share of leather footwear exports in the world market is more than double the share of non-leather footwear. Now, efforts are very much required guys to promote non-leather footwear to be able to effectively capture world market. Why? Because if you see in case of China, literally they are slowing down with respect to exports. Now it is high time for India you know, to capture that market. That will definitely boost up the Indian economy, right? So now you can even include that particular point also here, guys. So, so that to uh, substantiate your answer in a better way under the you know tariff and tax policies. Moving on to the next challenge, we have discrimination export markets. So let us see how that goes. 
See, India's competitors, exporting nations uh, with respect to apparels and leather and footwear, they all always enjoy better market access by way of zero or at least, you know, say a lower tax tariff in two of the major importing markets, namely the USA, that is United States of America and the European Union. So now, when this is the case, what happens to India, guys? Though we have an advantage with respect to apparel and leather in exports, we are not able to overcome or we are not able to stand up with that international or the global standard competition because, you know, we are not able to enjoy better market access. That is the thing. The sector specific challenge with respect to leather and footwear sector and the comparative advantage in cattle guys because we do get this uh, le uh, leather from where from from the cattle right from their skins we do make so now that is why it is mentioned comparative advantage in cattle here however despite having a large cattle population what happens to India's share of uh, cattle population guys India's share of global cattle population and the export of cattle hides it is literally low and declining okay so that when that is the case what happens again we are our uh, leather industry is at a stake we are literally declining right and now this trend it can be attributed to the limited availability of cattle for slaughter in india because of all your uh, cultural and social again all those constraints the cattle which is available for slaughter is very very less in our country thereby what happened it lead, leads to the loss of a potential comparative advantage due to underutilization of the you know evidently available natural resource when you are not able to utilize the natural resource that you have in excess what happens literally it's a waste it is not either not giving us any profit at the same time it's not contributing anything as a whole so now this again is one of the most important challenge guys that our economy is facing so with this i think we've discussed uh, some of the most important points and now it is time for us to conclude so when you're going to conclude you can put it in a more you know better way as to the introduction of gst that is a goods and service tax they offer a very excellent opportunity guys in order to rationalize this domestic indirect taxes so that they and they do not discriminate in the case of apparels against the production of clothing which uses man-made fibers and also in the case of footwear against the production of non-leather based footwear to put in simple terms what we're trying to say is that see the initiative done by the government with reference to gst has literally enabled us to make it more correct or more rationalizing your domestic indirect taxes because all these things are not coming under direct tax system right all these apparels leather footwear they come under indirect tax system where the tax is hidden or inclusive in the price of commodities that is why we have said it as indirect indirect uh, taxes okay so thus you can uh, end up the answer by this conclusion you can also add your own points guys and uh, this is how you will uh, you know answer this particular question and you can even expect the same question for your mains because already a similar qu kind of question was asked uh, previously and i hope this answer has literally helped you out in understanding with reference to the you know importance of apparel leather industry in indian economy so the next question is Indian economy is more formalized than before. So substantiate emphasizing the importance of formalization of Indian economy. So this particular question is talking about the importance of formalization with respect to our Indian economy. That is, there is a need for formalizing most of the sectors so as to make our Indian economy much, much better. So now, to begin with, guys, as per your economic survey, okay, the, uh, based on that, uh, the informal informality definition is given. So informality or rather formality of an organization can be decided by two main factors. What are they? The first one being social security provided by firms. And the second one is based on firms under tax net. That is which all firms are coming under the net of taxation. That is the basis in which this particular formality or informality is based on. Okay. Now, based on this particular criteria, according to economic survey, 87% of firms, they are purely and 12% of firms are under tax net. But at the same time, they do not ha come under the social security net and less than 0.1% are in social security net and not in tax net. This particular data also you can include in your answer to provide your answer with the better statistics which will fetch your marks. So now if you see the Indian Economic Survey guys, it provides or it talks about how compelling is the, our economy towards formalization because that there has been an urgent need for that. So now this particular formalization, what we are talking here is due to four key shifts and based on the criteria that I have told you before, that is uh, based on social security provided by firms and based on the firms coming under tax net. So based on this particular criteria only, we have even uh, you know explained with the, uh, the shift of formalization. Okay. First one being the introduction of GST, that is goods and service taxes that has brought literally brought more firms into the tax net. That is very true, guys. And now if you see the number of enterprises who are paying indirect taxes, that has literally gone up. The number has shooted up 
by 3.4 million thereby an increase of 50 percent and that is again because of the introduction of GST by the government so that is again from this already understand a kind of shift to formalization is there right because of the transparency in your tax system the second point we are going to talk about the demonetization guys that is one again another important reason for this shift that is the demonetization decision which is taken by the uh, government on November 2016 that has led to a statistically significant or a drastically I can tell you a significant increase in the number of new income tax filers that is to an extent this particular demonetization has enabled us to you know to uh, get in all the black money because most of the black money were converted to white money right at least to some extent you could you were able to achieve the objective of this particular concept of demonetization that is uh, yet again another important key shift of formalization you can even include that point also guys and the third point that which we which you can mention is there is a substantial increase in the coverage of welfare scheme for example the uh, atal pension yojana that is where all these uh, you know transfer payments or unilateral, unilateral payments because it comes under your welfare uh, schemes that is why they're called as you know transfer payments or unilateral payments so now the uh, coverage of that is too huge uh, there has been a very much increase and in people are getting benefit uh, out of all these social welfare schemes and that is yet again uh, no, no, an another important key shift showing towards formalization and now nearly if you see a third of uh, non-farm Indian workforce of 240 million has some social security coverage guys again you can even include this data to support your uh, third point and then more than half of the non-farm workforce they are employed in firms and literally they now pay taxes which means that more of the people are coming under the tax net making it more transparent making it more uh, sensible for the government and the government revenue is literally increasing so that that can be contributed for the growth and development of a country in a better way so that is the reason why we want to formalize the entire structure or entire Indian economy right from informal sector and the next important uh, shift uh, which we are talking here is the Indians are putting a greater proportion of their savings in the formal financial sector. That is very true, guys. And now, these bank deposits that swelled after demonetization, literally, you know, people got, uh, they didn't know what to do because when demonetization came, they didn't know what to do with their money. Uh, uh, you know, somehow they were rushing up here and there. And finally, after demonetization, what happened, guys? The deposits, bank deposits, uh, literally started increasing because of digitalization, all these things. You know, it, it was on the rise. And now, Though the booming stock market has also made financial savings through mutual funds that became more attractive compared to your gold or real estate, which means that after your demonetization, you could see that the, uh, the gold or real estate literally it came down, right? So now people are focusing more on mutual funds and that became more attractive. And that is how the booming stock market has they are made their financial savings. That is what this particular point is talking about. That is yet like another important key shift of formalization. Because we know that in real estate, bottle corruptions and bottle fraudries are taking place, right? A lot of uh, black money is there as compared to white money when coming onto your real estate business. So this is yet again another shift which is focusing on formalization, guys. So these are the key important or key or the four important shifts with reference to formalization of Indian economy. Now we are going to talk about the advantages of formal sector guys because in this question we are totally supporting formalization of Indian economy. So it's very important for us to talk about the points which will support the formal sector. We should know why is this formal sector very very important. So now the next heading could be the advantages of formal sector. So the first point is it helps in improving tax collection by bringing more transactions inside formal system. That is very true because we have seen the previous points where how did uh, more firms come under your tax net due to introduction of GST, right? That's your goods and service taxes. That first point, uh, you can uh, link it with, with that. And the second point is, this formal sector, guys, it reduced the incidence of black money. Yeah, then again, corruption, red tape is some and also lessen legitimation owing to well-defined structure. You know, all these are simple points, all what we have discussed, you can even include this point. And then the third point which you can talk as an advantage of the for having a formal sector or formalization of Indian economy is that it will lead to better data collection like your GDP, growth rate, etc. That is perfectly true guys because whatever statistics we are getting with reference to gross domestic product, they, they are just numbers. They don't give us exactly what is the real value, right? Because of the existence of all these, you know, unorganized sectors. So now when formalization is taking place, what happened guys? Everything has to be accounted. Everything will have, you know, take place in a very structured manner. So definitely a better uh, data collection with respect to GDP and growth rates will be available. That is yet another important advantage of formal sector. The next point being effective formulation and implementation of welfare scheme. We have discussed about the adult uh, pension yojana where we, we could see that, right? It's, they are, it's an old uh, scheme also. 
there was a lot of coverage, a substantial increase in that coverage of that welfare scheme was there. So now, because of formal sector, you know, a, a lot of uh, impro, uh, programs or welfare schemes and other uh, th things could be very effective in its formulation and implementation. You can even add that point. And then another point which you can talk here, guys, and the advantage of formal sector is increase the formal banking and financial inclusion. That is very true. And then it will also benefit the farmers, guys. How? By reducing the intermediary. That is, we are talking about the middlemen. Okay. Or things will become more direct. Okay. So, thus, it will help them to realize better prices for the crops. When you do have middlemen, what happens, guys? The farmers are not able to get the real prices for the, uh, uh, their crops are produced, right? Because they have to depend on this middlemen uh, for, you know, the prices of the, they are produced. Whereby, this middlemen do a lot of fraudery. They do a lot of corruption in between. They really don't uh, give the farmers what they really owe. Okay, so all these things you can overcome uh, if you have a formalization of, uh, you know, uh, these sectors. So these are the advantages or benefits of having a formal sector. Thereby, it will benefit the Indian economy to a greater extent. Apart from this also, guys, you can include so many other points as to the advantage of formal sector. But make sure that you are including points giving importance to each sector. Make sure the points are not repetitive in nature. And again, identifying the demand supply trend through forward or future markets and using it to reduce the industrial wastage through optimum or maximum utilization of resources guys that literally help the firms in making or improving their profits thereby what happens your supply chain is becoming more efficient that also is one another way uh, you know or another benefit of formalizing your engine economy so these are the most important benefits or advantages guys of formalization of internet economy and finally after mentioning the advantages uh, you can directly go to the conclusion whereby you can talk about see in this era of digitalization and advanced technological advancement guys such as your e-payments your e-governance your e-national agriculture market it can be inferred that what a formal setup of markets will lead to what the inclusiveness of all these stakeholders which means that we do live in an era of total a digital economy, right? Everything is digitalized and economy is pushing uh, more and more. The government is pushing us more and more to be more digital. Even demonetization was also a you know a key part of that to make the economy more digitalized, to make sure that every transaction is accounted, it is more transparent. So you can include all these points in your conclusion. And thus, when you're doing that, what will happen? It will increase the, it will increase the ease of or comfortability of doing your business, thereby improving your business index and also it will channelize or direct your country towards development. So this is how you can conclude your answer in a better way. So I hope you've clearly understood all the questions that you've discussed uh, here and this is a way you have to approach your answers with respect to the questions that we have discussed. Thank you.